Bibles tonight to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. We'll teach you some things tonight. I think that it will help you uh, in your understanding of Scripture and understanding God's desire and plan with His Word. In verse 16 it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now if you, if you do any circling of your, in your Bible, and you, cho you choose to do that, or mark in your Bible, circle that word mystery. Because that word is a very key word in what it means in that particular context, and it's, it is used in a few other verses in Scripture in the same context. But it doesn't mean what a lot of people make it to mean. Great is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. God was manifest in the, spirit, in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the, in, on in the world, and received up into glory. Now that word mystery is a word which normally people interpret or normally people take to mean something that's unintelligible or not able to be understood. And that's not a, that's what that word means in the verse. But rather it means that what is to follow in that text, in this verse, is of great consequence and that it had been hidden prior to it being revealed. Now make no mistake, God is all about understanding. Leave your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 <clears throat> because there are many mysteries that God has placed in His Word, things that were not revealed by the prophets until later. And Jesus, of course, the Messiah, um, was prophesied thousands of years before. But it wasn't until the fullness of time that God made him of the seed of a woman, brought him into this world. And so it had been hidden, meaning that <clears throat> those during that time it had not been revealed to, but once revealed, everybody could see it, and they could understand it. And so, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is a passage which is important. It relates to the tongues, uh, the false tongues, um, and or the unbiblical way to look at tongues. But there's a principle. Verse 33. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of, what? Confusion but of peace, as in all churches. And go back a few verses. And <clears throat> verse 23. If therefore the whole church be together into, in one, into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned and unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or, un, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at least, at the most, by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other, be, other, other judge. If any man be, anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Again, for God is not 
the author of confusion. Um, go back a little farther in the text and we'll begin in verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now here it is. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks? Seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than ye all. Paul spoke many languages, and that's how he was able to do the mission work. God divinely gave him that gift to be able to speak in unknown languages. And by the way, unknown languages are not the babbling that we have today. They were known languages. And so <clears throat> he had the ability to speak in native tongues. God gave him that ability, just like he gave the 120 witnesses the ability to witness in native languages at Pentecost. Now verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be children, but in understanding be men. So understanding is very, very important. And so <clears throat> when people don't understand certain things, and I've used this expression sometimes, they use this expression, well, it's a mystery. As though God doesn't want us to know and understand. The fact is, is this text teaches us that mysteries God does reveal and makes them understandable, but they may not be revealed until afterwards. And so it's the ones who he reveals them to that understand. We read Revelation. Everybody's trying to figure it out. And we know that those things in Revelation are a mystery. Have they all been revealed? Has the sun turned to moon, uh, the moon turned to blood? Uh, has the church been called out? Has the Antichrist come? The Bible says the spirit of iniquity doth already work. So <clears throat> we spend far too much time in preaching and teaching and in ministry on things that we can understand. But we should focus on what we can and what God has revealed. And so he, this mystery of godliness starts, and the, the poignance of it in verse 16, when it says, God was manifest in the flesh. Now this mystery was prophesied by Isaiah. It's prophesied by others in Scripture. It's prophesied by Micah. And yet, the Jewish people were not given the revelation of it. It wasn't until centuries after. But once God sent Christ and He was manifest in the flesh... What was revealed and what we understand is how amazing it was that God would become man. The perfect, most perfect being in the universe coming down to condescend to lowly men and actually becoming sin. As early as Abraham, he began to speak of the mystery as he sent Isaac up with his father to Mount Moriah. And as they get up there, Isaac asks the question, where is the lamb? He's not a child, but is probably either a teenager or more like a college age. So he's not a, not a little kid. And he gets up to the mountain and 
still no lamb. He, his father builds the altar, puts the wood on it, and lays his son on it. And he pulls the knife out of his sheath. And Isaac knows what's going on. He's not oblivious. But he doesn't fight his father. And you know the end of the story. The angel cries out, Abraham! Stops it. And then <clears throat> he looks in the thicket and there's a ram. Now as Abraham is going up the mountain, his response to Isaac's question is, God will provide himself a lamb. What it pictures is that God would not allow Abraham to kill his son. And had he allowed him to, it would have been against Jewish law, though the law had not been given at that point. But God was showing to Abraham what he was going to do in the future. Still a mystery, not fully revealed, but that ultimately he would do what he put Abraham toward, up to. But he would carry through. He would provide himself a lamb. And interesting, isn't it, that when John the Baptist, who was prepared a... Uh, if, you, if you've read the preparation, how much preparation went into God being made flesh? Think about all that went up to it. Zacharias in the temple doing incense and an angel standing to his right and says, you're going to have a son, and they're in their 80s. And he says, how shall this be? My, you know, my wife's barren. And the angel says, I'll, I'll show you how it's going to be. You're going to be dumb. Now, that's not stupid, okay? But you're not going to be able to speak until he is born. And that's the sign. Elizabeth, shortly after that, conceives. The child is filled with the Spirit of God before he even is born. A signification of the preparation, uh, much like Jeremiah when he said, I ha I've you know, called you from the womb. And so God anointed John the Baptist even from a baby in preparation to prepare the way of the Lord. And so all these things went into God becoming flesh. Well, that little boy who grew up and then became a man and became the greatest prophet that has ever walked the face of this earth, and that according to the God-man, Jesus, pointed to the Son of God as he came into his presence and said to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So the mystery was back with Abraham and the Old Testament saints. They had no idea how God was going to pull it off, but the revelation and the understanding came when John pointed to those two disciples, and two of them were Peter and Andrew, and they ultimately followed Jesus when he said, Behold the Lamb of God. So there is a mystery that is hidden in generations past, that once revealed, brings understanding. So first, the mystery of godliness was that God was manifest in the flesh. Secondly, he was justified in the spirit. Everything that Jesus did, he did anointed by the spirit of God. When he was, when he began his, when he was baptized, what did we see? Well, John the Baptist was told, upon whom ye see the Spirit of God descending upon and resting upon, he is the one. He's the Messiah. And John recorded, go to Luke chapter 1, and uh, let's 
turn there. Actually, John chapter 1, excuse me. Verse 15. It says, John bear witness of him and cry, saying, the, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. Now listen to his expression. For he was before me. Twice in this chapter, he uses that expression. Once again in verse 27. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. Why was he not worthy to unloose the latchet of the shoe of Jesus? Because he knew that he was God. And so John was humbled to be the one to lay the groundwork. The Bible talks about um, the, about the highway and, and making it straight and taking all the crooked out and all the high places and the low places, making way for the king. That's what John did. John paved the way for the Lord Jesus to come into the ministry. So he was, ju he was ju or God uh, was manifest in the flesh and he was justified in the spirit. From his baptism, after he was the spirit of God, came and, de and descended upon him like a dove. The Bible says he was driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. He immediately started his ministry with temptation by Satan for 40 days, or actually for, for one day, but after he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And he passed the test. But he did it in the same power that we are to have as God's people. He did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was justified by the Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, enabled him in everything that he did. And so, <clears throat> going back to our text, the mystery of godliness is first God becoming man. Then, it was... The mystery of godliness was that he was justified in the spirit. Then it was a mystery of godliness because he was seen of angels. Angels took a great interest in the Lord Jesus and his ministry. Even fallen angels took an interest in his ministry. Every demon-possessed person, they were cast out by him by the power of the Spirit. And they would ask him, or would say to him, I know thee who thou art, Jesus, the Son of God. They acknowledged him as God. They recognized him because prior to them being cast out and put on this earth with Satan as the prince of the power of the air, they bowed before him on his throne, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They knew who he was. Jesus, when he was being taken in the garden, said, Don't you understand that I can, at this point, I can call 12 legions of angels? After he was tempted, go, go to Matthew chapter 4. After he was tempted of Satan, I want to show you the interest that the angels had um, the, we, we know that the Bible says they are ministering spirits to us who are the saved, the saints of God. Matthew chapter 4, the Bible says <clears throat> in verse 11, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. It's a great mystery, the mystery of godliness. Aren't you glad it was revealed that we might be saved. That brings us to the next point. He was seen of angels. He was preached unto the Gentiles. Now this was, that was very difficult for any Jew to accept. And so the mystery of godliness 
that they could not wrap their mind around was that ultimately there would be a light to the Gentiles. Prophets prophesied that he would come out of Galilee. Uh, by the way, several, good, several great prophets, Elijah, they, came, they, they ministered in those regions and, so, and ministered to those who were Gentiles. And so Jesus, when he was in his public ministry, spent a great deal of time all up and down Galilee, which the wonderful mystery of godliness was that it was revealed that God had a heart for not just one nation of people. Although the Bible says that the gospel was to the Jew first, Paul said it's also to the Greek. And so what the mystery of godliness was and what was revealed is that God truly did love the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Jesus taught about the Master who sent uh, an invitation out to all of his friends. And they sent back excuses. That's a picture of him sending it out to those closest to him. His own people. The Jews. And they made excuses and said, I can't come. And so he said, go out into the highways and the byways. And, in, and into the streets, and he said, compel them to come in. The, good, the maim, the halt, the blind, the poor, the good, the bad. And by the way, that's pretty much the Gentiles, okay? Doesn't mean there weren't some Jews that were not rascals, but the Gentiles did not have the laws of God written in their hearts. But rather, those, they, they, were, they were heathen. And so the mystery of godliness is that God opened his heart beyond Israel. And though they, though they were his peculiar treasure, he opened his heart up to each of us. That mystery was revealed to Abraham. What did he, what, we'll go to Genesis 12. Here's the mystery. He would be preached to the Gentiles. Genesis chapter 12. The Jews recognized Abraham as what? Their father, right? In fact, Jesus went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Pharisees. And he said, You may have Abraham as your father, but God can raise up these stones if needs be. And so, Abraham was not only the father of Israel, or blessing of Israel, but look at what it says. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Didn't understand that. Not back then. But we understand it now. Because the father of many nations, whose seed, not seeds, but seed, found in Galatians, would be born from the seed of a woman, would bless all nations as God opened his heart and preached the gospel to the Gentiles. The mystery of godliness. The Bible tells us here that he was preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. That's, a, that's something that years ago would, people would struggle with to believe. Will people really believe in Jesus? It was a mystery. But when Messiah came... The world has believed. We've believed. We're here. And churches all across this country and all across the world have believed on him. Because as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe 
on His name. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye might believe on the name of the Son of God. That was a mystery, but it was revealed in generations prior to us, and has con continued to be understood that God, uh, whosoever will, may come. In that he, he, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out that we can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. And many would have doubted that. But look how many people have been saved because He came. And will continue to be saved as He waits to return. The last mystery was His ascension. It had been prophesied. Uh, people had pe it, it was a mystery. Was not revealed until his disciples were standing on the Mount of Olives. And just imagine being there and watching him go up. You know, I, I've, I have, and, and a lot of a lot of people have given the disciples a, a difficult time. They're just standing and gazing. We don't know how long. But the fact is, if we had been with him for three and a half years, he had poured his life into us, and he had done everything he could to, to express that mystery and to explain to them that mystery, but it was hidden to them until that day. Now, they understand. And the angels wake them up, snap their finger, tap them, whatever, and said, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Once that was revealed to them, they did exactly to the letter everything that Jesus told them to do. They went back to Jerusalem. They began to get on their face and pray. Pentecost came. And the Bible says, These that have turned the world upside down have come hither. Great is the mystery of Godliness. Our Father, we thank you for all that you did. And Lord, as we continue to enter into the Christmas season and we are look forward, looking forward to next week being here for Christmas Eve and then being together with our families on Christmas Day. May we be thankful that we have had the privilege of understanding having the mystery of godliness revealed to us. That we can say beyond a shadow of a doubt that we know we're saved. That we understand that because we're saved, that He has given us a calling. He has called us to ministry. He has given us an opportunity to serve Him with our lives. And to always be thankful for the amazing salvation. Yes, great is the mystery of godliness, because it's hard for any of us to wrap our mind around the thought that you would even care enough about sinful man to do what you did. A wonderful song we sung a minute early, earlier, How Great Thou Art, expresses in a wonderful way how much you did. but it can't do justice to how great you really are and what you really have done. We pray that you would help us always to be sobered, just as John, recognizing who he is, or who he was, and who Jesus was. And always realize that none of us in this room are worthy to unloose the latchet of his shoe. Keep us humble, keep us thankful, and keep us faithful 
as we continue to live our Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's